أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف خلقه وخاتم أنبيائه وسيد رسله نبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين <تصفيق> وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المطهرين المكرمين قال الله العظيم في كتابه الكريم وهو أحسن القائلين وأصدق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وما تلك بيمينك يا موسى قال هي عصاي أتوكأ عليها وأهش بها على غنمي ولي فيها مآرب أخرى قال ألقها يا موسى فألقاها فإذا هي حية تسعى آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم Respected brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته One of the most intriguing aspects of the behavior of humankind is the ability to undertake a conversation In other words we as humans feel the need to communicate with each other utilizing the ability of speech in order to convey a particular message to another or a direction or sometimes a warning. Therefore, you'll find that conversations or communications are part and parcel of human behavior. The Quran tells us of a number of conversations that took part in the history of mankind, ones that will take place on the day of judgment Amongst the important conversations that you and I are told about, which has great significance, is the most important that the human being can undertake. And of course, that is with the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who in the case of Musa, Moses, peace be upon him, created the sound that he communicated with his chosen prophet, his chosen servant, Musa alayhi salam. In the sacred, blessed valley of Tuwa, this conversation is presented to us in many parts of the Holy Quran, namely, of course, in chapter 20, Surah Taha. In this particular chapter, Allah wa Taala informs us that after setting the scene, as far as what Musa السلام, was going through his experience, telling him what he has just now received as far as revelation is concerned and the principles of faith. The Almighty asks him, وَمَا تِلْكَ بِيَمِينِكَ يَا مُوسَى What is it that you have on your right hand, O Musa? Of course, Moses, peace be upon him, had his staff, his cane, his stick that he would use. And this question, as we discussed last time, was primarily either for Musa السلام, to be set or to have this calmness for him before given the responsibility of going to propagating the message of the unity of God and standing uh, on the face of an evil tyrant uh, such as Fir'aun or it could be regarding the emphasis of the cane that what is it in your hand in other words what you have is not something normal now of course this cane or the staff of Moses is a subject of much discussion in Abrahamic faiths namely Judaism Christianity and Islam if you go to the uh, Jewish traditions you'll find there's so much discussion about the reality of the staff of Moses. You'll find that, for instance, in the second book of the Torah, known as the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, much of the story of Moses is told there. And the staff of Moses occupies a prominent position in this uh, narrative. You may have come across the movie uh, The Exodus quite recently, uh, I haven't watched it myself, I, although I do want to see it as I'm told that it is quite controversial, rather being slightly better, although missing many of the 
uh, key features about the life of Musa alayhi salam, but better than the previous Hollywood movie talking about the Prophet, and that's Noah, of course, which was denounced by many faith groups, Muslims and non-Muslims alike. Even though we look at this particular film, you'll find that much of it was taken from, or at least some elements of it was taken from the second book of the Old Testament. The Bible, this uh, book, the Old Testament, talks about, very interestingly, it talks about two canes, two sticks. One belonged to Moses and another one to his brother Harun, Aaron. And intriguingly, the one that belonged to Aaron also had miraculous occurrences attributed to it. So it wasn't just the staff of Musa alayhi salam, but also his brother had a cane too. And some of the Jewish scholars have discussed whether this is actually the same as the one that belonged to Moses, but it seems that they have come to the conclusion that there is a, a staff of Aaron and there is a cane of what? Of Musa. And of course, they talk about the role that this staff had later on in condemning and causing the destruction of the kingdom of Fir'aun when the Almighty God instructed Musa to place the same cane where? In the sea or in the river Nile, depending on the uh, theologians or the historians' uh, own conclusions about that particular place. And it, of course, opened up for Bani Israel and it closed for the Copts and those who were followers of Fir'aun. In, in the school of Ahl al-Bayt, we have some narrations such as the one from Imam uh, Muhammad al-Baqir salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi in al-Kafi, uh, volume 1, page 231. He uh, is narrated to have said, كانت عصا موسى لآدم that the staff of Moses was actually one that belonged initially to Prophet Adam alayhi salam. فصارت إلى شعيب شعيب was given, or somehow the staff was given to Shu'ayb. ثم صارت إلى موسى بن عمران. Of course, Shu'ayb is the father-in-law of Musa, and therefore passed on the king to Moses. Then Imam says, وَإِنَّهَا لَعِنْدِنَا The cane is with us, the Ahl al-Bayt. وَإِنَّهَا This is interesting, in Al-Kafi. وَإِنَّهَا لَتَنْطِقُوا إِذَا اسْتَنْطَقَتْ It will speak if it is told to speak. وَتَصْنَعُ مَا تُؤْمَرُ بِهِ And it will do what is commanded for it to do. This is, of course, narrated, narrated from the Imam, peace and blessings be upon him. But today, if you go to Istanbul, this uh, famous uh, museum that I have seen, I'm sure some of the brothers and sisters have visited, is called the Topkapi Palace. There they claim they have the hair of the Holy Prophet. They claim they have Dhul Fiqar, although it looks like any normal sword. It doesn't resemble Dhul Fiqar at all. It looks like a sword they've bought from the market down the road. Um, although I can't denounce it as easily as this, uh, they seem to have evidence that it is the sword of Amir al-Mu'mineen, but also they claim to have their what? The cane of Musa in that particular uh, palace. But according to the riwayat of the Ahl al-Bayt, it's actually with the Ahl al-Bayt, peace be upon them. Now, in the Quran, Allah Taala discusses the story of Bani Israel as mentioned before, perhaps in over 900 verses, 900 ayat. And one of those, or a group of those, in Surah Al-Baqarah, discussing the story of Talut. Talut is a very interesting figure because he's also discussed in the biblical texts as well as the Holy Quran. We believe Talut was not a prophet, but a righteous individual that Allah Taala chose. He came several hundred years, possibly after Musa alayhi salam, and uh, he led an army against Jalut, Goliath. Yes, so. What happened, of course, was that one of the signs, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, one of the signs that Talut had for Bani Israel, because Bani Israel came to their prophet, this Samuel, according to the Bible, they said to this prophet Samuel, they said to him, we want a king to lead us against the wretched 
rulers who are usurping our wealth, who are enslaving our women and children. So Allah wa Taala said to this Prophet that I have chosen as a king for you Talut. Talut came, Bani Israel looked at Talut and said, sorry, we don't accept you. He said, why? He said, number one, you're not wealthy. And number two, you're not from a well-known family. You know, I, had a, I have a discussion about Talut in one of the examinations that we had in the month of Muharram. And I discussed how this is one that resembles many communities, their approach to marriage. You know, when it comes to individuals, when they propose, they look at this individual. Well, number one, you're not very wealthy. And number two, you know, you're not from this particular town that I had envisaged my daughter or my son to marry. And therefore, despite the fact that the Prophet had said, if somebody comes to you with akhlaq, with good manners, as well as importantly, iman, then make sure you marry them off. If you do not, there will be a rise in corruption on this earth. Despite that fact, I don't accept people would say, yes? Likewise, Bani Israel, they would look at Talut and say, sorry, I'm not going to, we're not going to accept you as a king for us because the Quran says in Surah Al-Baqarah, yet Allah Taala through this Nabi, this Prophet, which the Quran does not name, but names Talut, says to Bani Israel, says, look, Allah is the one who chooses and this man is a king. Now, if you want proof, he will provide you proof. What, what was one of his proofs? He was given a small, uh, like, box. This, apparently, is the one that Musa, a.s. was placed inside, like a cradle, when he was uh, put in the river Nile. Inside was the staff of Musa. Inside was the staff of Musa. So this Talut was given it. The, our riwayat tell us that he was given it by the malaika somehow, it reached him, and it was a sign for Bani Israel that he is definitely from God. So the king of Musa therefore has this particular interesting uh, elements associated with it. Now when Allah wa ta'ala asks uh, Musa, what is it in your hand? You might come to the idea or might present a question in your mind as to why would Musa explain to the Almighty Jalla wa ala, the purpose of his king? Yes? You know, especially as parents, the parents know this very well. We are sometimes very impatient with our children. You know, they come to us and ask us questions and they say, but you could see what I'm doing. Why are you asking me? You know, it's so straightforward. It's right in front of you. There's no, it's not a mutashabih verse. It's not a very metaphorical aspect. We're not asking you about the verse. They're asking, for instance, about something quite simple. Why is this like this? Right? A child asks the parent. Here we have the conversation between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Musa. And Allah says to Musa, what is it that's in your hands, in your right hand? Musa begins to explain the purpose of his king. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that Musa replied back by saying, number one, it's my king as an identification. What I do with it is I use it to uh, somehow uh, lean, or it helps me when I walk to support me, number one. Number two, I use it to bring down the leaves from the uh, tree or from the bushes for my cattle and my sheep to eat. Yes? And I have other purposes, I have other usages of this particular king too. An individual who is inquisitive Quranically should always pause the button when they are reciting verses like this and ponder and reflect. Why did Musa alayhi salam explain the cane in such a way? Of course, it is indicative, our ulama from the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam say, this is indicative of an individual who is enjoying the conversation, who is feeling sweetness, who is feeling some kind of bliss and tranquility. You know, sometimes when we've had a really, really tough day and a hard day at work or college or whatever, we don't want people to talk to us. And if they do, we answer one-worded answers. 
or as quick as we can because we're not bothered or tired or, you know, not in the right mental frame. But when we sometimes are in a good mood, we want to talk, we want to converse. Now, they say Musa alayhi salam here recognized this maqam is known, they say, this is maqam al-munajat ma'al mahboob, they say. This is the place of the special conversation and secret whispering with the beloved. Musa did not say, oh my Lord, this is a cane, you know. Musa said, I have a chance to speak to Allah. Let me maximize it and say as much as I can. And therefore, what you find is that the opportunity to converse with the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala was very much um, utilized by Musa, peace and blessings be upon him. This of course brings us to um, an interesting area. Before I talk about this, just a clarification. I know some of the brothers and sisters have attended, alhamdulillah, this particular session for uh, a number of weeks, but just to clarify, that our discussion and analysis of this chapter, there are two types of tafsir that normally happens. There is the classical tafsir, which is an interpretation, which presents to the reader or the one who contemplates the meanings of the verses, essentially, and deals with misconceptions or some objections, ideas that are presented around those verses, like this. Why would Musa speak and describe the cane in such detail, Quranically? Because the Quran does not mention anything other than the fact that it was important. But there is another tafsir, a style of tafsir known as a tafsir al mawdu'i Tafsir al mawdu'i means subject-based interpretation. Meaning that you come to an ayah in the Quran and you press what? The halt or the pause button and you explain a subject related to that verse that is relevant to people, that is relevant to day-to-day uh, -to -day life. And that's the style that we have undertaken, and that's why uh, over 10 weeks we have only reached verse number 18 on an average of nearly less than two ayat a session because we are focused on subjects that are related to the ayat concern, and that's what the Qur'an is all about. Isn't it? It's all about showing us the path. It's showing us what are we supposed to do when we look at these verses and how should we apply them? How should we learn from them? Therefore, when we come to this ayah, what does it mean to you and I? It signifies the, the importance of a very important act of worship, one that is emphasized continuously by the Qur'an and the Ahl al-Bayt and that is munajat. Now of course, munajat is uh, defined in Arabic as uh, a matter whereby, or a process whereby uh, individuals speak or converse in a quiet, secretive manner. And normally what happens is they are whispering. It's called whispered supplications as we know it the munajat that we have at our disposal and remember the hadith that we narrated that Musa السلام, said to Allah he said oh Allah oh Allah are you close so that I do najwa munajat with you or are you far that I call you yes dua means to supplicate or to call. Munajat is what? Something which involves proximity, which involves closeness. Now, the Quran quite beautifully in many verses talks about najwa or munajat in many different levels. So you have the first uh, set of verses that talk about the actions of human beings when they gather together in small groups and they converse with each other and they hold these secretive communications between each other. Allah says in chapter 58, verse number 9, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, idha tanajaytum, fala tatanajaw bil ithmi wal adwan wa ma'asiyyat al-rasool. O you who believe, if you undertake this munajat between yourselves, 
and I put a, you know, open bracket, these WhatsApp groups, you know, you open a WhatsApp group between yourselves, as an example, yes. Allah says, you're having these secret conversations and no one knows about it, as far as other human beings are concerned. Or you're sitting together, for instance, in a gathering, right? Now, Allah says, if you do that, make sure the conversation that's secret between you lacks al-ithmi wal-adwan, does not involve sinning or transgression against others. وَمَعْصِيَةِ الرَّسُولِ Number three, disobedience of the Prophet. Then Allah says, shall I tell you what you should be conversing? You know when I was reflecting on this verse, I thought, you know what, what do people normally talk about in secret? Some things that they don't want others to know, which normally, normally, sometimes, involves things that they're not very proud of, or may not necessarily a positive thing. Something they've done that they regret or remorseful about, or they don't want the whole world to know. Allah says, do not converse in these three areas, privately, in the most secret of ways. Speak in secret if you want to, but keep a pillar of what? Righteousness, good, bir, and fear God in these conversations, in these secret communications. وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ الَّذِي إِلَيْهِ تُحْشَرُونَ That's chapter 58, verse number 9. Then the Qur'an tells us, you know, there's a discussion in Ulum al-Qur'an, the sciences of the Qur'an, about the science of abrogation or the element of naskh. How many verses in the Qur'an were abrogated? So they were revealed, but later on, what? They were abrogated. In other words, the rule or the hukum does not apply anymore. According to some scholars like Ayatollah Khu'i, he says this verse that I'm about to recite is probably the only verse that was ever abrogated, although it's a discussion. This is verse chapter 58 again, verses number 12 and 13. What's the story? The story is this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Muslims, you come and you have co uh, conversations with the Prophet, Prophet of Islam, peace be upon him and his family, in the most secret of ways. You do munajat with the Prophet. Because, you know, as, the, as people do today, of course, no comparison, but people do today with scholars. They say, you know, can I speak to you in private or, you know, I have something I want to ask. Yes? They used to do this, of course, above all, with the Prophet. Allah says to them, if you're going to do this with the Prophet, every time you come and ask him a question in private or secret conversation, pay sadaqah. This is the verse. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, idha najaytum al-rasool. Again, munajat. Najaytum al-rasool. فَقَدِّمُوا بَيْنَ يَدَيْ نَجْوَاكُمْ صَدَقَ Offer some sadaqa at the beginning. Then the Quran says, ذَلِكَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ وَأَطْهَرْ It is better for you and it gives you purification. It's good. Give sadaqa. Now, you look at history. There was only one man who every time he came to the Prophet, after this verse was revealed, to converse with him would give sadaqa. No one else. Only one person, Sunni and Shia narrations come forward and say it was the commander of the faithful, Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. He was the only one who would give sadaqah. So what happened? Nobody would do it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the next verse. Verse number 13. You find it so hard when you come to do najwa with the Prophet to give sadaqat? Now this has been removed. Now you don't need to no longer give what? This charity when you come in conversation and in the uh, communication with the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and his holy progeny. Of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when talking about munajat and najwa, here we're talking about people between themselves, reminds you and I about an important element. Chapter 58 again, verse number 7. أَلَمْ تَرَ أَنَّ اللَّهَ يَعْلَمُ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ Allah knows whatever is in the heavens and whatever is in the earth. مَا يَكُونُ مِن نَجْوَى Once again, there is no najwa. What's najwa? Conversation, secret. ثَلَاثَ إِلَّا هُوَ رَابِعُهُمْ Beautiful. Allah says, you know, if three people gather together, they're not three, they're four. وَلَا خَمْسَ إِلَّا هُوَ سَادِسُهُمْ Even if they're five, God is... Number 
six. Number six doesn't mean, you know, chronologically, but the number as in, he's there. وَلَا أَدْنَى مِنْ ذَلِكَ وَلَا أَكْثَرُ Either lower or more. إِلَّا هُوَ مَعَهُمْ أَيْنَمَا كَانُوا Wherever you are, the Almighty Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala is with you. ثُمَّ يُنَبِّئُهُمْ بِمَا عَمِلُوا يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمٍ Allah knows everything and reminds you about your secret conversations on the Day of Judgment. We believe... The Quranic principle of the manifestations of actions on the day of judgment. Tajseemul a'mal. What is this? The Quran tells us every single deed that you and I perform will become something that we will see in a creation of God that will stand before us on the day of judgment. We have a narration that says a believer on the day of judgment is taken, the hand is taken, towards Jannah by a creation of God. He or she doesn't know what this creation is, but is pleased that it is towards Jannah. Once they get close to paradise, to the gates of Jannah, he or she looks at this particular creation of God. The riwayah doesn't tell us the physical manifestations, a creation of God, and asks, what are you? The response would be, I am the happiness that you placed in the hearts of believers in this world. Happiness. Interestingly, that becomes manifested in a what? In a creation of God. That is a source of blessings and uh, prosperity for uh, the human being. Now, of course, munajat, my dear brothers and sisters, when it comes to the most important munajat, and that's with the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have the best group of people who mastered this relationship, and that is the Holy Prophet and the Ahl al-Bayt, peace and blessings be upon them. And that's why we have so many of their munajat at our disposal and others do not. When I say others do not, I don't mean it's closed off to others, others are welcome. But they have not unlocked the treasures of the Ahl al-Bayt who have understood how to speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in such a way when it comes to munajat, yes? It's the most important of relationships indeed and you look at Sahifa Sajjadiyya we have 15 munajat narrated from the fourth holy Imam Imam Zain al-Abideen alayhi salam which you know stem or go from the munajat of Ta'ibin, Shakirin, many other stations or areas in which you and I can benefit and a, and a tip would be that if we make a habit to recite one of them daily not necessarily after each salah, because you know, let me be honest here, and quite brutal. Sometimes what we do is we become very habitual, and all we want to do is what we've learned and what we're told to do. So, there is after each salah, there is a ta'qib, you know, a dua for salatul dhuhr, for salatul asr, maghrib, isha, fajr. Beautiful, very nice, and if we memorize them, excellent. But what happens is we become so systematic that all we want to recite is that, and nothing else. Why? We have treasures, Sahifa Sajjadiyya, there's the du'as of the week, yes, that the Imams alayhi salam have passed on. There are these beautiful munajat. Instead of the taqib, for instance, if you can't for Dhuhr and Asr because you're at work or college, do it for Maghrib and Isha. Or, you know, if you really can for Fajr. I know it's hard. But pick, on one, pick one of these munajat and recite after a fariva, after a, a wajib, and you will see, you will begin to understand, especially if you read the translation, if the Arabic uh, uh, is difficult to understand, or if it's hard, take parts of it, break it into segments, and recite it, make a habit of recitation, what, at least once a day, so that what, it becomes what, you become acquainted with these beautiful uh, uh, words of the Imams alayhim salam. There are so many munajat that we can talk about. I'd like to draw your attention to one munajat that uh, uh, I have seen some ulama emphasize upon. It is this, this is known as munajat of Imam Zayn al-Abideen alayhi salam. And this munajat has been recommended for those that are suffering with hardship and difficulties. And uh, wanting respite uh, from their suffering. Ilahi, kayfa ad'uka wa ana ana 
وكيف أقطع رجائي منك وأنت أنت Beautiful words as always from the Imams of the Ahl al-Bayt uh, The Imam alayhi salam would say to him Oh my Lord, if I do not ask you and you do not give me Then who should I ask? Because I know no one else can give other than you So these are words from the heart And if they're recited from the heart Then if it is best for us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with his permission, may alleviate our suffering and our hardship. This is a dua that is uh, found in uh, Mafatih al-Jinan. It's also, as you can see, you can find it in many websites such as uh, duas.org. But the key thing as we approach the month of Sha'ban, Munajatu Sha'baniya, this wonderful, sublime supplication, and munajat from Imam Amir al muminin peace and blessings be upon him. And then the month of Ramadan, the month of munajat, isn't it? The month of secret whispering and conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to unlock our potentials, to purify our hearts, to elevate our spirit and our souls to the high statuses that the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to actually reach. Now, قَالَ أَلْقِهَا يَا مُوسَى Now, Musa alayhi salam is told to what? To throw the cane, not to place it. There's a difference. أَلْقِهَا is not the same as what? ضَعْهَا Place it, throw it. And of course, this is in relation to what is about to happen after Musa alayhi salam throws this particular uh, cane or staff. Now, can you imagine what's going through the mind of this prophet of God? Having gone through these phases of questions, you know, and uh, uh, this conversation, now he's told Musa, this cane of yours, throw it. Now before we go to the next verse, some of the Mufassirin have said something quite beautiful actually, um, quite nice to actually reflect upon. They say, you know, this Musa's cane and staff is what? It's a piece of wood, isn't it? A stick, it's a piece of wood, a simple one. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had made it by His might and power so instrumental. So influential, hasn't he? And a whole kingdom of Fir'aun collapsed through what? A stick, simple stick. Yes? Now, this is interesting because uh, the moral to learn from this is we should never underestimate anything. People could laugh at this stuff and say, what is this? This can't do anything, you know? Today, when we talk about our awaited Savior, Sahib al Asr wa Zaman, Ajallahu Ta'ala, Farajah Sharif, people say, Oh, he needs to have the greatest nuclear weapons and all that. And he, is he going to come on the horse and the sword? What is that going to do? I tell you, what is a stick going to do to Fir'aun? One small staff that Musa alayhi salam uses for his cattle and for him to lean on. Destroyed the emperor, uh, the whole empire of Fir'aun, didn't it? With the permission of God, the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, the key thing is here not to ridicule anything, including insects, objects, you know, that we may not understand their purposes for. Because uh, we have these narrations that, for instance, this wretched man, Al-Mansur al duwaniqi at the time of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, one day Imam Ali salam was there uh, in his session and Mansoor was bothered by this fly would constantly come and sit on his face and he would push it away. Then Mansoor would look at Imam Sadiq and say, Ya ibn Rasulillah, why has Allah created this small fly? What's the point? And Imam Sadiq would look at him and say, this is the bravery of the Imams so that it would humiliate the wretched tyrants. You think that you're sitting on top of the world, yes? governing all the country, so to speak, but you can't stop a small fly from annoying you. Yes? To humiliate 
if an individual would take heed. I remember reading a hadith or a story that one day Musa السلام, was traveling and he came across what a group of ants or some small insects. And he looked and he thought to himself, why are they there? What are they actually doing? So then he spoke to Allah. He said, oh Allah, what is the point of these ants? What are they doing? You know, sometimes we look at ourselves, not in an arrogant way, but thinking, you know, Alhamdulillah, I'm a human being and not an insect. I have a role, you know. What is that insect doing? So Musa says to Allah, oh Allah, what is this insect doing? What is the purpose? Allah reveals to him, oh Musa, this insect asked me about you the same thing. <laughs> oh Musa, it said to me, this huge figure, what is his role? What is he doing? So do not underestimate. Everything comes coming from Allah has a purpose. Everything coming from Allah has what? Has a function. Allah in the Quran says, وَسَخَّرَ لَكُمْ مَا فِي الْأَرْضِ Everything on this earth has been made for you to utilize. There's a reason why it's there. And we cannot say it is created in vain. Allah Taala does not create anything in vain. So this brings us to a very interesting conclusion about this. قَالَ أَلْقِهَا يَا مُوسَى فَأَلْقَاهَا فَإِذَا هِيَ حَيَّةٌ تَسْعَى Musa alayhi salam throws this particular cane and of course it turns into a massive moving snake. Tas'a means one that has a swift movement. And it, uh, it, it is quick, but it doesn't run. That's what tas'a means. Now, the beauty of the Qur'an is that it describes certain stories from different angles in different chapters. So in Surah Al-Qasas, verse number 31, Allah says that he said to Musa, وَأَنْ أَلْقِ عصاك. Throw your cane. فَلَمَّا رَآهَا تَحْتَزُّ كَأَنَّهَا جَانٌ Musa saw it what? Saw the cane shaking as if it's a real thing. Jan means something which has life. وَلَّا مُدْبِرًا وَلَمْ يُعَقِّبْ This is in Surah Al-Qasas. Musa immediately did what? Turned his back and started running away. وَلَمْ يُعَقِّبْ means he never turned back. He didn't want to see what's going on. He started running away. As soon as he saw this particular uh, creation of God, of course, incredibly frightening uh, sight. Uh, and one thing to say here, Musa knows this is not an illusion. You know, sometimes if we go in these uh, theme parks or these 3D movies and people say, oh, yeah, I'm not scared. Well, you know, you're not scared because it's not a real thing you know, that is hitting you or apparently hitting you. But it's different when Allah is telling you, throw this particular uh, cane and all of a sudden you see it's a huge snake right in front of you. Yeah? It's an intrinsic human reaction. Now, of course, there is a question here. A prophet of God, does he become scared? Can they experience fear like we do? Or are they supposed to be human beings that have surpassed this element and have no fear at all? It's an important question because people say, you know what, a prophet running away? How can that be? Because you and I run away, fine. But a prophet of God, should he run away or not? That's a question that we will investigate in detail when we talk about the levels of fear that the Quran explains and tells us and which level the prophets have and which they do not have, insha'Allah, as we continue the discussion of Surah Taha next week. Wa akhru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa salli allahumma wa sallim wa barik ala sayyid al-mursaleen Muhammad wa ala ahli baytah al-tayyibin al-tahirin.